Welcome to the Real Comic Heroes Podcast. Your adventure into the world of comic book movies starts here. Greetings, citizens, and welcome to another adventure of the Real Comic Heroes Podcast. My name's Travis, and uh, no Patrick today. He said he had to go do one last mission for his boss or something, and he'd, he'd be back. So uh, hopefully we'll get him next time. But uh, not alone on this one, uh, Sean, welcome. Hey, what's up, man? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the, uh, for the invite. I've, I've been looking forward to discussing this one with you. Well, glad to hear it. Uh, you've, I think you've, you've submitted like essays to us in the past for uh, Punisher and Captain America. Yeah, no, actually, I guested uh, with you guys when you guys did Masters of the Universe a few years ago. That's right. Um, okay. Yeah. That's and right. then I submitted, I did an audio essay on um, Captain America actually, when you guys did that. Yeah. And so it's hard to believe. I mean, I know both your show and my show, we go in chronological order. So it's just kind of weird considering, I mean, when we looked at Master of the Universe, that was 1987. We're now at 1997. And my respective show, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm now at about 2016, 2017 or so in uh, in Mr. Lundgren's career. So um, it, it's kind of weird to think that my, my podcast will be kind of coming to a, a pseudo end here uh, here in the next year so yeah and uh i guess just a quick plug for the for the listeners uh your show is i must break this podcast you can do it with a with an accent as well if you want to do like an ivan drago <laughs> dolph lundgren accent i found that some yeah. people have fun with that but no. um yeah yeah no uh yeah the the podcast is i must break this podcast um available on itunes and uh soundcloud stitcher all of the uh the podcasting apps and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a ton of fun. Um, basically, uh, I go through Mr. Lundgren's extensive filmography each episode. I look at a different film of his, and we really just pick it apart and discuss the, the merits of it, if there are any, and just kind of look at how <laughs> he has evolved, I guess, over yeah. his entire career. I think he's had a fascinating career, and um, yeah, it's been it's been a ton of fun. I mean, we started, obviously, with Rocky IV, and now we're already at... Uh, 2016 like i said earlier and um yeah it's just a it's a ton of fun it's it's monthly so each month a new a new episode comes out and uh in between the movie review episodes i've been fortunate uh i do a lot of interview episodes so i get to speak with um tons of individuals who've worked with mr lundgren over uh over his career from uh, uh, uh screenwriters directors stunt performers actors you name it so um it's uh yeah it's a ton of fun yeah. i urge everyone to to check it out, even if they're not big into uh, Mr. Lundgren or his movies, I'd like to think that my interview episodes shed a little bit of light on the uh, the independent uh, uh, action market. Yeah. Um, so you said you uh, <clears throat> were looking forward to coming on for Spawn. Uh, let's let's talk about that because this movie holds a, has a special place in my heart. Um, so I'm really curious to hear like what your history is with the movie and. What, what's your history with Spawn in general? Yeah, I was really looking forward to going back and discussing this with you um, because Spawn came out. I mean, I think you and I are about in the same age bracket, if, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, Spawn Probably, came yeah. out Yeah, in, the, in a really interesting period. Uh, comic collecting back in the early 90s was a ton of fun because that was... That was the huge boom, okay? That was the comic sure. collecting boom. I distinctly remember going to the comic shop on the weekends, and that place was packed. Not just with uh, with, with kids like myself, but with also, also grown adults. You know what I mean? Um, because I think the yeah. idea was, and this is kind of what created the huge bust, but the idea was that they were an investment, okay? They That they were, you know, um, if, if you had a collection, you would you know, keep it in an attic or whatever, and then... You know, you, you'd buy two copies of each issue, especially those number ones. Those number ones were the, the big issues oh, yeah. to get. You'd buy, you'd buy a couple issues, one to read and then one to, to put away in the attic or whatever. And then theoretically that would be used to your kid through college, I guess, was kind of the, uh, <laughs> was kind of the thinking. Sure. And um, Spawn is a really, really interesting character. Um, I, I don't know what your experience is with him, but I remember um, 
when Image Comics came out. Image Comics was that was a big oh, yeah. deal back in the day because you know you had the you had the big two. You had Marvel and DC. Those were the huge um, comic book juggernauts, if you will. And then you had this company kind of come out called Image Comics that was owned and fronted by artists themselves. Okay, who had pretty much um, maybe not been exiled, but had decided to leave the big companies and do their own thing. And so here you had this little company um, called Image who was coming up and were pretty much stepping up to the plate and kind of going up against the big two. And it was really like, it was a big deal. It was like, are, are they going to do it? Like, are they? And, right. and they did. They did. I think I- the thing with Image is it was started by the biggest artists and writers in comics at that time, like in the nineties, that's, you know, that boom in the nineties was, you know, a big part because of people like Jim Lee and Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld Mm -hmm. and several others who left Marvel because they were tired of not, they didn't, they couldn't own their characters. They couldn't do what they wanted with their characters. They didn't own Spider-Man and the X-Men and, and whoever. So they left yeah, it was mostly Marvel artists, and yeah, it, it was just it was a really cool time. You, I mean, it was I mean, it's just kind of really wild to think about. But back in this time, yeah, the comic collecting boom. I mean, they did this at the right time. No way would a company oh, yeah. come out to come out today in 2022 and be fronted by these artists and be the big thing that it was. Um, you know, nowadays, not saying that they wouldn't be successful, but. I don't think it would yeah. get the same fanfare that it did. And the other thing, I mean, you, you kind of alluded to it, but the other thing that we have to realize is back then, these artists were like rock stars. I mean, they were movie oh, stars. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I think to the if you did not read comics and that was not your bag at all, then maybe you wouldn't have known about it. But I mean, Rob Liefeld was on the Dennis Miller show. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, I mean, that's just, it's just kind of wild to think that we lived in a time where these um, these artists were were celebrities. There's a wonderful documentary I don't know if you've seen it or not, but uh, called the Image Revolution. Have you seen that? I haven't. Okay, check it out. It's it's pretty easy to find. I think it's free on like Tubi and Hoopla and all those. But it's a documentary all about um, all about the rise of Image and how these artists pretty much bucked the trend, stepped away from Marvel, and created their own uh, their own company. And going to Spawn, what was interesting mm-hmm. about it is I think these artists were very very keen to the fact. Okay, yes, we're starting a company. Okay, and and what, what's really interesting, that's why I recommend you check out that document because they they admit that yes, they were artists first, but they really didn't have a heck of a lot of business sense, so they really didn't know what they were doing, you know, putting together a business. Hence the the constant delays that came out of Image Comics. I mean, there was oh yeah, there was one book, there was one book that I loved called uh, Pit by Dale Keown. The artwork in Pit was sure. amazing, but Pit ran for like five years and really only put out like. 10 issues. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so the, the delays were a huge deal, but what they think, what they did is each artist came to the table with their own respective comic book, with their own respective right. uh, character that all kind of existed in this universe. He had Eric Larson, he had Savage Dragon, Rob Liefeld had Young Blood, and uh, Todd McFarlane had Spawn. And I would argue, I think out of all of the characters that came out from uh, uh, I- Image Comics from their infancy, um, Spawn and Savage Dragon are the two that have been the mainstays that have stayed with Image since oh, 1992. Yeah. yeah, Spawn is still an ongoing series, and it's still that same continuity, I guess. I, I well, like Spawn, that, but... well, Spawn and Savage Dragon, to my knowledge, are really the only two. But yes, yeah, Spawn and Savage Dragon, to my knowledge, I think those are the only two comics from Image that have stuck with the monthly schedule that have adhered to the monthly schedule and have, uh, have been coming out. And with regard to the movie, okay. That came out in 97, this came out at the right time for spawn because spawn came out in 92 issue one came out. In I remember going to the, uh, a comic book store that weekend and buying an issue thinking if I get this number one, that's going to be worth some money. And for the movie to come out, you know, five years later, they really struck while the iron was hot and the movie came out right at, um, Right at the character's prime. Mm-hmm. Specifically with the movie, do you remember seeing it for the first time or like what your memory is? Oh, about? yeah. Yeah, definitely. I actually, I saw this opening night in theaters. Mm. It came out um, summer of 97. Yeah. Uh, August, I want to say. August in, 1st, uh, 1997. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I going back to the comic, you know, I, I, it's interesting. 
I wasn't the biggest Spawn fan. I mean, I remember buying sure. issue one and I wasn't, I wasn't the biggest fan, but at the time I distinctly remember thinking to myself like, wow, Todd McFarlane really <laughs> bucked the trend yeah. with creating this character. Cause if you look at that character, it's, it's very different than the average superhero. And I think, I think Todd McFarlane was, was aware of that. He wanted to, he wanted to create a superhero that was the exact opposite of everything he had seen. Right. And so, I mean, if you just go to Al Simmons right there, Al Simmons is African American. Sure. And I, and I, that was a, that was a conscious decision on, uh, on, uh, Todd McFarlane's behalf yeah. where he wanted to create, you know, uh, a, a superhero who, who was African American, which we really didn't have a heck of a lot of mm-hmm. at the time. Um, the fact that he is a hero who also comes from hell, I think was like, wow. I mean, that right there is huge risky <laughs> gamble too. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I think, I think it's those touches. Oh, and also Al Simmons is an assassin. Sure. You know what I mean? So you have all these things there. You know what I mean? He's an assassin who comes from hell and that's going to be your hero. Like that was, I mean, nowadays you kind of look at it and you think, well, we have tons of antiheroes. Yeah. In 1992, we didn't see that a heck of a lot. That was, that was pretty cool. And his costume was just so rad. The way, yeah. the way Todd McFarlane drew those capes and how his cape just always engulfed the character. Right. It was always just so amazing to watch. Or excuse me. To- and he was coming off of, you know, like I said, he left Marvel. He had created Venom, you know, Eddie Brock, mm-hmm. Venom. Uh, that's where a lot of the spawn, you know, the the living costume symbiote kind of thing comes from. And yeah, it came off of a, a huge run on Spider-Man and change the way that that Spider-Man could be drawn. Like he would put him in poses that seemed impossible, but makes sense given the character is supposed to be, you know, creepy and be able to contort all kinds of different ways and has this, you know, super enhanced equilibrium. So he can get into all kinds of misshapen positions. And then the webbing, the spider, you know, webbing that he would shoot out would be, this gnarly, you know, messy webbing that I think Todd kind of used for the chains of Spawn, the kind of living chains that he would throw out. So yeah, he, he b- borrowed some stuff like that, and but yeah, it was a it was a huge made it, made a huge impact. Well, and uh, going go to going to the movie, I mean, yeah, I I remember when this came out, I was I was stoked for it. Like I said, I wasn't the biggest um, Spawn fan. Yeah. I, I only had it. At the point when this movie came out, I really only had maybe half a dozen of the issues, but I knew the comic. And what's also what's also interesting is you got to think around 1997, we really didn't have too many comics based movies. Yeah, for okay? sure. And <laughs> and and what we did have that summer was uh, Batman and Robin that came a, a couple months before. Oh yeah. By the way, by the way, I listened to your episode on that. That was <laughs> hilarious. But um, but yeah, so to have a new comic based movie, especially based on this character who. I mean, I think if I do the math right, I think by the time this movie came out, it had really only been really only with like 40 some odd issues or so. So it was still yeah. a relatively new character. But what's so cool about it is he was the character who, even if even if you had kids at your school who didn't read comics or who thought that comics were, were kitty or lame or whatever, Spawn was that character that everybody liked because he was that badass character, kind of like Wolverine. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's the one who made who made reading comics acceptable because he was the bad guy. If you Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why I would have been, I guess wizard magazine would have oh, hipped yes. me to spawn. Yeah. I would have been following along with, you know, reading about the character, even though I wasn't reading spawn comics at the time, but I would have been well aware of the hype around the character. And I remember seeing it that same summer. I was 14 um, I'm pretty sure I got dropped off at the movie theater and, you know, was allowed to see it by myself because, you know, my, my parents and my, like they didn't they weren't interested in this. So I, mm-hmm. you know, I'm I'm 90 percent sure I saw this by myself and then I was obsessed with it. You know, I told mm-hmm. told my friends about it, um, you know, right before you know school started, you know, really soon after this came out. So I know I was talking about it there, but. I definitely was in the minority as far as people who had seen it that I knew, you know, as a 14 year old kid. I mean, this this movie was right up my alley, especially after the seeing Batman and Robin. 
Oh, most definitely. And I think what was so cool about this one is it seemed like all of the pieces fell into place for this movie to, to work. I mean, in a lot of ways, if you think yeah. about it. I'm, I mean, first of all, um, a New Line Cinema picked this up for distribution. And I remember thinking to myself, when I first saw the trailer for this, um, New Line Cinema, that, that, se- that was like, that was the perfect house for this film to come out of. You know what I mean? This is not mm. uh, a, a movie that uh, I could see coming out of Universal or Warner Brothers or 20th Century Fox or any of those other ones. It seemed like this one coming out of the same house as uh, Ninja Turtles and Mortal Kombat just was perfect. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of New Line Cinema DNA in this movie. I noticed <laughs> it a few times. Um, I'll talk about it later. But yeah, I definitely, like at a certain point, I was like, oh yeah, this is made by New Line. So Yeah, and I, I also think what this film did right, I mean, it, do, it does a lot of things right. I mean, first of all, it is so perfectly in tone with mm. the, uh, uh, or in tune, I should say, with the tone of the comic book. You know what I mean? And I think this really did a did a good job of that. There there aren't too many yeah. funny parts. I mean, it's dark when it needs to be dark. Um, I think the, the one thing that it, it didn't do right when it came to theaters was they didn't make it R-rated. They made it PG-13. However... Yeah, I was going to say when that, it, that... Yeah, when, when it came to VHS, if you remember, it, to have the unrated cut. Man, can you remember that yeah. back in the day? How, how cool right. that was to have an unrated cut? And when you watch the unrated cut... They don't go as hard as maybe I think they could have and they should have. I think there's only maybe a few curse words in it, and that's sure. it. So you, I think he says "holy shit" at one point uh, when he's fleeing from the cops outside the the building. Like, and then I read the, what the differences were, or saw like on IMDb, and it listed the differences. Like, there are a, f- a few more scenes of violence, like towards the end, something like that. So, as far as like tone goes. I don't know because I found myself questioning like who, what is the audience for this movie? You know, it's rated PG 13, but they, they're yeah, because there's several things in the movie that are meant for kids. It's like, it's like little kid humor, but then there's also the clowns like crude, very, you know, adult humor stuff that, you know, is mixed. It's trying to be edgy, it's like, I don't think they know who the audience, who they wanted to make this movie for, because I think and it I think really yeah. is muddy. I think that's the character. I think that's the character, to be perfectly honest. I mean, oh, sure. Th- this, is a, this is a character that is that does not appeal to audiences. You look at a character like Spider-Man mm. and Thor and Iron Man, I think one of the big reasons why those films have done so well and you know keep generating you know sequel after sequel is because those are characters that everybody has a little something to relate to you look at a character like spawn i mean he's a former black ops assassin who gets sent to hell and comes back <laughs> to become to become hell's a uh, warrior or whatever that's yeah. not you know what i mean man that that's not i mean i think sure. to an extent that's also why the Ghost Rider movies never really clicked because, you know, right. those movies are purposely trying, and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I know years down the line for you, but I think one of the reasons why those movies never really clicked is because that's a character that is kind of being pigeonholed into this kid friendly um, Marvel universe, and it just doesn't yeah, work. So that's fair. Yeah. I, I, I will say, I think Michael Jai White is perfect casting for mm. the character. I mean, Michael Jai White, I mean, it's interesting. I, 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 he's perfect, though, in this film. He's pretty much like a Wesley Snipes, if you will. And I think one of the big reasons sure. why he, his career never really um, latched, if you will, and, uh, and, and found as much success as, say, a Jean-Claude Van Damme or a Wesley Snipes is because he kind of came onto the screen a little bit too late when those action movies were kind of mm. starting to peter out. Um, if he had oh, come yeah, onto yeah. the screen, if he had come onto the screen a few years earlier, he would have had the same career as all those other action guys. Now. Yeah, um, this was definitely my first time seeing him in anything, and I I like him in this movie. I mean, ninety percent of the movie he's in heavy makeup, you know, so he's performing as this you know disfigured, burnt character. So you don't get to see a lot of him. I mean, although it, it is him. Uh, yeah, I, I like him. I think I think his performance holds up. You know, we'll, we'll get into other characters later, but I, I, for the most part, most of the characters I think work in this movie. We've got the uh, it, it opens with uh, a little brief exposition thing over some like flaming, you know, imagery, 
uh, religious iconography, that sort of thing. And you hear uh, Nicole Williamson's Cogliostro talking about, you know, the battle of heaven and hell. I sort of, I wish that the movie had opened straight away with the assassination scene. And then it, it ends, that scene ends with an explosion. And then you go back into this flaming visual, you know, religious kind of iconography. And then with more narration and exposition and, and then the credits. So I kind of wish they had just taken the brief exposition dialogue, you know, put it after the, this assassination attempt, but wouldn't have made know. much I mean, difference. Yeah, no, I, 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 I see where you're coming from. Um, I think, I think that's, that's kind of the, the tricky part though, with adapting any comic book series, because mm -hmm. whenever a, a single film is coming out, you know, obviously any film when it's made is hoping to become a franchise, especially if it's, if it's based oh, yeah. on a source material like this, but if it's not, then you gotta, you gotta put together that one film that is really going to encapsulate the characters and the feel and this, the overall mood of this particular comic book series. Yeah. So, you know, by the, when this film had come out, I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, I think, you know, it had been about 40, 50 issues in, um, I never really, that, that never really bothered me because I knew that, okay, mm. it's, it's trying to, uh, it, it, it needs to get to the action and it needs to get to the spawn character. And to be perfectly honest, I was actually okay with the fact that we didn't get a long drawn out origin sequence. You know, I saw an sure. interview, I saw an interview with uh, Michael J. White on some podcast recently or some interview and they asked him, you know, why didn't that movie, um, why, why do you think it didn't, it, it didn't click and it didn't, we didn't get sequels. And he said, well, they, they cut out so much of the character building with, mm. with him in favor of the special effects. And I guess in the original cut, there were more scenes of him with his, uh, with his uh, wife. Okay. Okay. I remember, uh, Wanda, I think is her name. Wanda. Yeah. There were a ton of scenes with him and Wanda and everything like that. And unfortunately they had to cut those to get to the action. And so when we see Michael J. White, he's covered in makeup. And so for an actor, I, I can certainly see him being disappointed in that. However, for yeah. me personally, I didn't really want to see scenes of him and Wanda. I wanted to see yeah. Al Simmons in that costume, tearing shit up and, and being yeah. the character. So for <laughs> me, I was, sure. I was just fine. The fact that we didn't get a long drawn out war. Well, they, it seems like they definitely must have used some of that footage because later in the movie, when you get flashbacks, they're definitely using scenes that we hadn't already seen, you know, so they weren't flashbacks from what we er saw earlier, but they were flashbacks from somewhere else in their history, you know, so they were definitely right. using what they had, you know, not long scenes, but I do kind of like the way this thing starts with get like this maybe five minute uh, intro assassination thing, then the credits, and then you get maybe like another five minute sequence with Al and, you know, Terry and, and leaving the house and going to work. Um, it's, and then talking to Jason, you know, I mean, we'll get there, but essentially you have like, that all happens in like the first 15 minutes and then he's dead and sent to hell. And then, you know, so I, I like the way the movie actually speeds along here at the beginning. So, I do too. That, I mean, that, and I mean, you, and you can look at it now. Okay. You can look at it now and kind of, you know, laugh and roll your eyes at the special effects, but this was also in the uh, early stages of uh, CGI. Okay. And where we saw CGI could go. And, and like I said, even mm -hmm. at the time when this came out, I remember looking at the CGI, the special effects and kind of, kind of rolling my eyes and thinking to myself, this is, yeah. this is pretty bad. I mean, the scene when Al Simmons <laughs> goes to, goes to hell and is talking to Mount oh, yeah. Bolgia and he's saying, yes, I'll lead your army and all of this. You know, I remember at the time thinking like, okay, this is, this is pretty weak, but um, you know, you have to give them credit yeah. for really, um, for really taking a swing. And I, I think, I think in the end, I think as we're going to come back to, I think it's better to uh, maybe you may miss, maybe you may strike out, but I think it's better to, to take a swing and at least try. And I know that in recent sure. years, I mean, I imagine we'll be talking about this, but I know that Todd McFarlane has been talking about um, doing another spawn movie. He keeps talking about it's going to be one that he directs all of this. Who knows if that happens? But one of the things he keeps saying, he's been talking about that for yeah. 20 years, you know, <laughs> 
Yeah. I, who knows if it'll happen, but I know one of the things he always talks about is he's like, well, if I do my Spawn movie, it's going to be void of as many special effects. And it's kind of like, True. okay, that's noble of you. It's noble to think, but I mean, if you opened the comic books, the comic books were always, I mean, some were more of a, like a crime uh, mystery, if you will, you know what I mean? But yeah. some of them, I mean, that the colors that were on the pages were just so electric, it popped off the page. And so for me, I always felt that the film, for the most part, captured a lot of what the comic book was going for. Oh, yeah. I I, I would agree. The, the first couple issues, you know, is obviously what this whole movie kind of tends, is kind of drawing from. And as far as like the CGI aspect of it that is definitely kind of what this movie is known for it, you know for having that such bad cgi but i will say that i found that i don't know at least half if not more of the cgi scenes actually work really well but the other half is so bad you know mm-hmm. all the scenes in hell featuring malbolgia and most of like the the spawn army they look so terrible that it makes the rest of it, it drags the rest of it down. But all the scenes with CGI Spawn, his his costume forming on him, I think actually hold up pretty well. And uh, when, when the Violator is, you know, a CGI character running around, I think that actually works pretty well. So um, I was watching, yeah. do you... Do you remember a, a sci-fi channel behind the scenes, like making of Spawn, like half a half hour thing that they they ran? I don't, I don't, but I do remember. I mean, I remember when this came out, um, doing a whole bunch of uh, uh, maybe not research, but I remember back when you know, it, it, like I said, I keep saying the early days of uh, CGI, but it was also kind of the early, the yeah. very very early days of the internet. And so you really didn't yeah. have a heck of a lot of information about movies on the internet. So what you would see would be in magazines. And so I remember picking mm-hmm. up uh, yeah. uh, like Starlog. I'm sure you remember Starlog and Comic C. And these were all magazines that kind of were looking at the movies that were coming out that summer. And so that was pretty much my, uh, my I guess, prep for the movie. And then around this time, the, uh, the animated series on HBO was also in production right. and was uh, was coming out. And so I think that the, the series on HBO was a really cool companion because anybody who felt that the PG-13 rating of this film watered it down, um, you could look at that, <laughs> uh, that, that HBO yeah. series and man, that one was ultra violent. You know what I mean? So I think in the end, between this film oh, yeah. and the animated series, for the, for the most part, you had a pretty good adaptation of what, McFarlane was going for in the book. It's also my understanding, I think Todd, yeah. um, sorry, McFarlane, it's not like we're buddies or like that, but I think he had a uh, uh, a really firm hand in the production. You know what I mean? Because this was his character. Yeah. So I think he was... Um, oh, his, yeah, his so name's in the, in the credits. Side, and... Yeah, he, he shows up in a cameo, you know, later on in the film. Yeah. I'm sure you saw yeah. his cameo scene. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the reason I brought up that that sci-fi, you know, little behind the scene things, I actually because I, I I taped that, you know, as a kid, I saw it, I I taped it when it was on. I would watch that, and I think that's part of because there was from August from when I would have first seen this, the VHS didn't come out until May of the following year, so that's you know almost a year, and I would just rewatch that making of you know, tape that I had. And I think because in that, everything that you saw from the movie, they used the best parts, I'll say. So everything Mm -hmm. in there looked really good. And I noticed, I rewatched it today, actually, on my lunch. Um, I found it on YouTube. And I noticed that even when they showed, because they do like a little featurette on the fact that they used, you know, guys from ILM, you know, were part of the the team of, of bringing all this stuff to life and they showed their computers and some of the scenes, uh, like the, the, the army of hell spawns, you know, in hell in the finished movie, they, they look really bad. But when they actually in this little documentary, when they actually showed those characters on the computer screens, they looked really good, which tells yeah. me that they, I think everything in this movie would have looked really good, but I think that 
they didn't have the time to render it all and make it look polished. No, no. I think this had a hard release date. You know what I mean? I think this had a hard yeah. release date um, of August that, that they were kind of racing towards. And so that makes total sense. I mean, just the the people that they had on this, you know, it was directed by Mark DePay and uh, Steve Williams, Spaz Williams, was in charge of, you know, the, the visual effects on this. And those two guys came from ILM. They worked on uh, the special edition stuff for Star Wars, which I know is not like a glowing, you know, thing on your resume, but that's, you know, one of the earlier things that they did, but they also did the alien creature in abyss, which still holds up. They did the, uh, the T-1000 for Terminator two. And, um, what was the other thing? Oh, the, the, the dinosaurs for Jurassic park and Steve Williams actually designed and built the T-Rex model that they used for all the CGI stuff. So, it's got pedigree, you know, it, these guys knew what they were doing. I think they just didn't have the time to render it all. So I think that's why you get such terrible scenes in hell. And I, I also think, and I, I, I could be wrong with this, but, um, you know, I think that the big noticeable thing, I mean, okay. If you look at, uh, if you look at the comic book, one of the most striking details, we already mentioned it, but one of the most striking features about the character of Spawn is the cape. So when you picture a film being made about sure. this, you you think that they're going to be doing something yeah. really, really cool with that cape. Unfortunately, his cape is not um, done in the film. My understanding from what I remember hearing was that um, they didn't include it because it just looked kind of silly on uh, on on the character, yeah. uh, on the stunt double and everything. So when it is in the film, it's only, it's all done completely by CGI. And I think there's only just a couple scenes where you do see that cape. I have a theory about it though. If you look at the, at the Blu-ray cover, the Blu-ray DVD cover for this film. Okay. Um, you see an image of Spawn and he's wearing that traditional cape and it looks like it's made of cloth. So I wonder, and maybe I'm wrong, but I wonder yeah. if that shot that we see on the, on the physical media cover was in fact a shot that was done when this film was in pre-production was kind of getting made and they had the cape and Todd McFarlane saw it and said, you know what, this is going to look ridiculous on film. Let's just scrap it and not do it. Cause I don't understand why they would have that shot of him wearing that cape that's on the cover. And then we don't see any of it in the film. And I mean, would I like to see a, him rocking that cape throughout the entire film? Yeah. But it's one of those things that also, I think in the end kind of makes sense. And I kind of forgave. Yeah, I know that I know exactly what you're talking about with the promo images of him in that cloth cape. And it is so jarring that you see him in that cloth cape when most of the movie he doesn't have a cape at all. And when he does, it's this CGI. Mostly it's a mess. You know, there's I, I think one time in the movie that the cape actually does look pretty good. And it's not the the moment that they were so proud of the moment of him busting through the the glass on the ceiling and drop it doing the hero entrance but that's not oh God, where it looks yeah. best you know but the one thing the other thing that i that i've never been really a fan of with this particular film is the use of guns i remember when mm. when this film came out i i mean and this is <laughs> kind of going all over the place here but i remember watching an interview with todd mcfarlane back in 92 when yeah uh, when when spawn came out and i remember him saying like we are going to have an issue where Spawn is using a bunch of guns and has a bunch of artillery because we get that that's what's in and that's what's selling. And I think he's kind of referencing Punisher. <laughs> Punisher was huge. And so I think they kind sure. of did that for fan servicing. But in the film, I've never really liked it. I mean, because, I mean, if you really break it down, this is a character who has these powers that are amazing. I mean, he's a hell spawn, if you will. And then seeing him use this artillery and everything yeah. never really made sense. It's like, you know, he has these magical powers, use that. And instead they have these scenes where right. he's just shooting. <laughs> I mean, in that scene that we're talking about when he comes through the window and everything, it's, you can see actually how ridiculous it looks because it's, it's in, it's not in daylight, but there's a lot of lights on the set in that scene. And so you see him in that costume moving around with those guns and it just does not look um, flattering in any way. Yeah, I, I, they spend 
maybe not too much time because really it's a short movie, but yeah, I wish there was less time devoted to the gunplay and him going to the artillery, but that was, I remember that issue. Like he, there was an issue where he goes to the, the armory and he steals a bunch of guns and brings them all back to the, the alley and all that. So they are drawing from the source material. So that's good. Yeah. But you know, and I like that they, they Cagliostro, gets through to him there towards the end and like, Hey, guns are useless against these enemies. You know, you're, you're dealing with demons basically. So guns are pointless. Yeah. And, but, and they, then they don't really do enough with the, the training, you know, montage. They, they kind of, you teach, he teaches them how to kind of use the chains and that's about it. You know, so. the training, the training montage in the film is very, very similar in, in terms of uh, length to the training montage in the Green Lantern. You know what I mean? And you always, yeah, yeah. You, you always do need a, uh, if, if you're going to have this character who suddenly is adopted with these powers, then of course you do need that training sequence. Um, you, like you, it's kind of like, okay, that went a little bit quick and suddenly he's mastered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's mastered. Yeah. Whether it's, whether it's Green Lantern's ring or, or Spawn's uh, uh, powers. Um, I don't know. It's one of those things that I kind of, I kind of looked beyond. Um, but the one thing that I would yeah. say that, that I've always liked about this film and I think needs to be mentioned is John Leguizamo as the clown. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, was... I, I'll, I'll admit right now, I've never been the biggest fan of John Leguizamo. I just, most, if you, if you look at his pedigree in his films, he, he does like a lot of trashy, which, which is kind, sure. of, kind of funny. <laughs> um, but I will say the, he is the pest. perfect. The pest and uh, summer of Sam, which is just, that yeah. Movie yeah. He like commits shower after watching. Yeah. Um, but I would say he is perfect here as the clown. He <laughs> he owns the role of the clown. He does an amazing job, I think. He's wearing those dentures and everything like that. I mean, I just think he does a, a yeah. phenomenal job. I, I agree. I think he fully commits to it. You you hate him the minute you see him, but because he's so damn annoying. But then <laughs> I think that that's the point of the character. And I think it works. I think he commits yeah. to the the physicality of it. You know what? Again, watching that uh, behind the scenes thing, like he had to like hunch over to get kind of that posture. You know, the the latex and everything that he had to wear was painful for him. It's a it's an interesting performance if you can kind of look past what the character is doing. You know, I was just gonna say, I think that's kind of the beauty, but also the difficulty of watching these films uh, from the late nineties on like high definition TVs nowadays, because when you're watching them nowadays, you can see, you know, you can see the latex very, very clearly on characters. And you can see when John Leguizamo is, is walking around kind of hunched over, you can see that, you know, he's on his knees in so many scenes, you know what I mean? I mean, and I, I, I didn't notice it then, but watching it nowadays, like I said, on Netflix or whatever, on like my, you know, my, my high definition TV, it picks up those, uh, those, those errors so much more clearly than it did 25 years ago. Although like, you know, I, I think one of the, I think this movie is actually shot pretty well. And I looked at the director of photography, who's Guillermo Navarro. And like, he, he goes on to do some great stuff. He became a Robert Rodriguez guy and did, uh, from dust till dawn. And, uh, he did Jackie Brown for Quentin spy kids. And then he also was a Guillermo del Toro guy and did, uh, most of his early stuff, Kronos devil's backbone, Hellboy, pan's labyrinth, Hellboy two, and then a bunch of stuff in between. And then Pacific rim, like, He's, he's, I think the movie actually looks pretty good. Well, yeah. I mean, he, I mean, Mark, what is his name? Mark, Mark Depay. I Depay? think is his name. Yeah. Yeah. He has a really interesting style about him and he doesn't have a heck of a lot under his belt. I mean, I looked at his IMDb. He has like 16 credits, uh, directing credits to his name, but he is like a pro in the world of visual effects and he's directed a bunch of uh, animated movies. So I think he knows the limitations, but also the, um, the ways that uh, CGI can be used to help tell a story. Um, and so, yeah, when I looked at this, I, I never really looked at the direction of this as ever really yeah. being a fault. 
You know what I mean? He did he did another movie that I caught about 15 years ago or so. It's like a sci-fi channel original movie called Frankenfish. And, and it's a it's a terrible movie. It's not okay. Good. But the special effects of the <laughs> fish, okay, in the movie that is eating everybody looks looks really, really good. I mean, compare you know, I mean it, again, it is a sci-fi original movie, so I'm not expecting a heck of a lot, but it looks really good, um, comparatively speaking. And you can see how much uh, CGI has grown in the years between Spawn and Frankenfish. I think Frankenfish is 2005. But if you can seek that one out, I think the special effects in that one are, are pretty good for the time. Hmm. I'll, have to, I'll have to look up look that up. I, I'm <laughs> not going to say that I'll watch it, but... <laughs> the next thing I want to talk about is the when he returns from hell and he gets in costume for the first time. Yeah, costume looks cool. I think the costume looks I, really, I agree. really cool. It's kind of it's basically hitting upon um what uh what the Batman movies have done is putting the characters in like a leather apparatus suit. You know what I mean? Gone are the tights mm. or anything like that. Are our superheroes, it's the late nineties, so all of superheroes are gonna be wearing that black leather. Um and I, I, I yeah. think it works. I mean it looks it looks demonic, it looks uh uh kind of scary at times, but uh but it's cool, it works. And it's true to the comic book too. That's the other thing we have to mention is it's very, very true to the to the source material. Yes and no. I think they get the right, you know, colors and, and shapes and that sort of thing. I I get why they went this route. And I like that it's it's not smooth like spandex would be. It's he's he's not Spider-Man and it's not molded smooth rubber like a Batman costume is at this point. It's very organic, it's rough, it's got texture it's bumpy, it's gnarly. It's what you think or what you can imagine this being a, a demonic, you know, symbiote. It's it's necroplasm. It's it's, you know, made from hell that it's this living symbiote that he wears. Um, and it's, you know, I, I think if you would have gotten Venom in a in a comic book movie before 2007, and they went practical with the suit like that. I think this is how they would do it. You know, that they would make it look all, you know, gross like this. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's interesting. Okay. How, and I, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to go down this rabbit hole, but it's really, really interesting how fans for years have maligned the Punisher movie. Okay. The, the one with Dolph Lundgren from 1989, how they have maligned that movie because mm. he did not have the skull. Okay. I mean, and if you yeah. think about it, like this is what all comic, this is what all comic book movies do is they, they look at the source material and they think, okay, well, how can we put this on film where it doesn't look silly? Okay. And the fact that the fact that he didn't have the skull for years has been the, um, has been the linchpin that, that so many fans have, have, you know, decried and gotten so angry about. But what's, what's really yeah. interesting to me is how, it's kind of like, okay, yes, at the time, 1989, that really would not have uh, looked, you know, believable and cool on film. But I didn't hear anybody complaining in 1997 when this came out about the changes that they made to the costume. I didn't hear anybody complaining in uh, in 2000 when the first X-Men movie came out that they put the characters all in black <laughs> leather. I didn't hear anybody complaining in, uh, in 2004 when uh, Spider-Man 2 came out and how they put Dr. Octopus instead of wearing a skin tight green jumpsuit or whatever, yeah. him wearing a dark green trench coat. You know what I mean? Like I didn't hear the fans right. complaining about that. It was, it was acceptable. So it was one of those things where it's kind of like, yeah, I, I think fans, fanboys, if you will, especially comic book fans could be probably the harshest critics around. And that's one of those things. Sorry to go off on the Punisher tangent, but it's interesting. To oh, no, no, no. Fans are, are accepting of one thing, but they get so pissed off at it. You know what I mean? It's like, sure. Oh, like <laughs> <laughs> we're a fickle bunch. Yes. Yes. So, um, but yeah, going to the, going to the costume, I think, uh, I think it works for the, for the aesthetic yeah. of the film. Like you said, it, it looks gross. Um, I, I know you, I know you kind of already mentioned it, but um, this film in terms of actors also got some, uh, maybe not heavy hitters on board, but some relative names. Uh, D.B. Sweeney, mm. Okay, who um, did a film <laughs> yeah. called The Cutting Edge? Okay, he was uh, oh, yeah. a pretty reliable character actor. And then Martin Sheen. Martin Sheen shows up as Jason Wynn. Yeah, I uh, I was watching that. Uh, like I said, that 
behind the scenes thing. And it has a little, you know, Martin Sheen is, is in that. And he's talking about, he was kind of drawn to this character because he's, you know, t- he's the head of the, the, the CIA, even though that's, that's not what they call it in the movie. It's like a six, but he's the head of this organization and he gets to be a villain. And then he was talking to his grandson who asked him, Oh, what are you doing next? And he says, Oh, I'm going to be uh, this Jason Wynn character in some, in some comic book movie called spawn. And his grandson's like what, spawn, you know, the spawn and, and was, you know, he, he got to see how excited that made his his grandson. And so that's part of why he at least not the reason he did it, but he seemed you know happy that he did it for that reason. And, yeah, he gets to be a scenery chewing bad guy the whole time. Well, and it's it just shows the uh, the difference, I guess, in climate. OK, from, you know, regarding comic book yeah. movies from the 90s compared to comic book movies nowadays. Back then in the late 90s, it was maybe not taboo, but studios were still running scared a little bit and afraid of adapting a, a, a comic book to the big screen. You know what I mean? And so as a result, actors were also a yeah. little, um, maybe not afraid, but a little hesitant to take on some of these roles, especially someone um, like Martin Sheen. I mean, he was in Apocalypse Now, for God's sakes. Nowadays, it's flipped. Nowadays, you have actors praying to God, hoping to, to get that to get that comic book series. Because what that is, is that's a franchise that's going to kind of sustain a career and keep a career afloat. You know what I mean? You have Anthony Hopkins showing up in Thor. You have right. uh, Emma Thompson and, you know, these just established, <laughs> yeah. classically trained actors showing up for these films. And so on, on one hand, I get it, but it's just really, really interesting how back in this, back in the day, it was, uh, like I said, I, I don't want to say frowned upon, but it was, it was a gamble as opposed to nowadays it's a safe bet. Oh, sure. Yeah. They were kind of, these were looked at as just kind of paycheck jobs or jobs in between jobs sort of thing. Yeah. But, um, but you know, I, the, the other thing, if we look at the, at the story, the other thing that I, that I really like about it is, I mean, he's the character of Al Simmons. I mean, he's a tortured character, like we, like we've said, but they really give him a variety of obstacles to, uh, um, to go up against. I mean, obviously, yes, he, you know, he has to be allegiant to hell, but he's also kind of trying to, you know, turn his back on them, if you will. But I also really like that they gave his, uh, his character, like he wants to get back with his wife, but his wife is now with his former best friend and they've, sure. they've they have a kid now together. And so you have him with that. And I think that was all Todd McFarlane. I think Todd McFarlane really wanted to give this character so many stakes to where, you know, there, there were so many different avenues for storylines and um, in the film, you know, maybe could they mm-hmm. have spent more time with that? Sure. But uh, I think in the end it works and it makes the character all the more sad. I think. I, I think now knowing uh, what you had said about there being a, a lot of cut material of Al and Wanda and their relationship, it makes the scene where Al goes to Jason and says, you know, I want out, you know, prior to that, we have one car ride with Al and Terry and Terry mentions that, that Jason's operations have been, have had a lot of casualties lately and then Al shows up at Jason's desk and says he wants out. So it, that kind of comes from nowhere. Uh, but we need yeah, to yeah. speed things along and get Al and Jason to be at odds with each other so that Jason can send him on this, uh, you know, suicide mission where they set him up to to be killed. So makes sense. But now knowing that their relationship was a lot more on screen, it makes that decision actually come from somewhere that we actually don't really get in the finished film. So what's also, what's also problematic is, okay, we're to believe that, um, that five years have passed. Okay. The five years have passed right. from when, uh, from when Al Simmons was killed to when he comes back to spawn and they don't do the best job in showing that lapse of time. I think the, 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 the I mean, other right. than the fact that the birth of Cyan, I mean, they have a kid now. I get that. But the other thing that they do that's... I think Wanda's kind of hair is longer. Well, it, uh, Wanda's hair is longer, but also the character of Priest, that's uh, that's Martin Sheen's right hand. Oh, yeah. Right hand assistant or whatever. At the beginning of the movie, she has long hair, but then it's yeah. five years later, and suddenly she has like a short kind of uh, 
a short little cut. And so I guess that's, oh, it's been five years. So she got right. a haircut. So um, do, you, do you know, by chance, <laughs> do you know the, the yeah. history? Do you know the history behind that character? Priest, I know she comes from the comic. Um, I think she's meant to be a blend of Chapel. Like, I think Chapel is the one who kills him in the comic. But I don't know much about Priest. So actually, Priest was created for the film. So the story behind it, kind of going along oh, okay. with what we talked about earlier with Image Comics and how the artists, how the artists own the rights 100% to the characters. So the story behind that goes is in the comic, it was Chapel who killed Spawn, who worked for Jason Wynn. However, Chapel yeah. um, is owned by Rob Liefeld, and when Rob oh, Liefeld okay. left Image Comics. Um, he also took that character with him. And okay. so the film could not use the, the film could not use that character because it belonged to Rob Liefeld. So what they did is they made Chapel a woman and they gave the name Priest. What's interesting though, what's fascinating about it though, is if you watch the animated series for HBO, I think they struck some kind of a deal with Rob Liefeld for that. Because okay. Because Chapel is in the animated series. Interesting. Yeah. You wanna know another you you may know this. You wanna hear another interesting like rights issue that is kind of in this movie um we get in the the big event scene or event gala whatever that scene is that spawn drops through the the skylight in whatever that event is they they do an establishing shot kind of going over the crowd and you see this woman in a green dress and they really focus on her. They give her, you know, Angela, a couple seconds of screen time. And yeah, it's this character, Angela, who in the comics, she, she pops up in spawn number nine and is introduced as this like demon hunt. She's a spawn hunting angel, like literal angel from heaven, you know, because the comics are all about like, heaven versus hell and literal heaven versus hell, not just, you know, metaphorically or whatever. Uh, so she's a, you know, a warrior. And, uh, but the cr- character was created by Neil Gaiman who took the character with him when he, you know, eventually left. He eventually sued image comics uh, for the rights to Angela and got, and he won. And then eventually he sold Angela to Marvel comics. Um, I think he wanted, Marvel man or something. He wanted something from Marvel. And so he sold Angela to Marvel and, you know, Marvel comics put her in a guardians of the galaxy storyline in like 2013, I think. And so, you know, she's now owned by, uh, by Marvel and a lot of aspects of, uh, Hela from Thor, uh, Thor Ragnarok are based on Angela. Like, in the comics, when Marvel introduced Angela, they decided to make her as Guardian, and she's now Thor's sister. So I think they took like, those elements and made Hela for Thor Ragnarok. So kind of interesting that in a way, with all this uh, multiverse, you know, everything that's going on with Marvel, the, the MCU, you know, technically you could squint and say that this aspect of spawn is technically in the, uh, the MCU uh, in the multiverse. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we're going to be t- discussing cameos, mm. I know um, Sam and Chwit, Sam and yeah. Twitch, the two yeah. uh, detectives, they, they show up near the, uh, very, near the yeah, end very of the end. film and uh, very brief. And it's my understanding that uh, McFarlane has talked about if they redo this, if they do another spawn movie, it's actually going to be from the perspective of Sam and Twitch yeah. that are going to be the two main characters kind of on the trail of Spawn. I don't know if it's something I, I really want to see, but, you know, um, okay, go for right. it. You know? Yeah, they, they've they been trying to do something with those characters for several years now. I know, you know, originally, you know, he wanted to do a, a Spawn reboot that had, it was more of a horror movie where Spawn was like kind of just a, a boogeyman type character that was more like seven, you know, with, with Sam and Twitch being the, the cops and that. And then, uh, he wanted, he, I I don't know if it's still officially cast, but he has, uh, Jamie Foxx lined up to play spawn and he wanted Jeremy Renner to play Twitch. And, uh, I don't know if that's a thing (laughs) anymore. And then a couple years ago, 
they announced that Kevin Smith was going to direct a Sam and Twitch TV series that like most Kevin Smith projects, you know, that get announced, like it's, it's completely gone away, but they, they, they want to do something with, with these characters, but. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, it's really interesting. I mean, if we, if we just go to the, the end and, and look at the end, I mean, it's, it, it pretty much becomes kind of like what we talked about earlier. It becomes kind of a, a CGI mess. You know what I mean? Yeah. It becomes a little too convoluted where suddenly Martin Sheen has this device attached to his heart. That <laughs> if you kill him, yeah. you can unleash this plague. And I mean, a lot of this stuff kind of comes in and it's, it's not really needed. And then you have, uh, you have Spawn teams up with Cogliostro and Cogliostro throws on his medieval uh, chain mail mm-hmm. and yeah. he joins in and jumps some and it, it gets a little too silly. Yeah. I think for, for its own good. Um, but you know what? I, I always kind of gave it a pass and always kind of let it go because I felt that the, the first 25 minutes were so rock solid, yeah. especially uh, John, John Leguizamo. John Leguizamo was the clown. I thought that was pretty good. But but yeah, I mean, the final the final battle is just it's 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 just a mess. It is. <laughs> and it's too bad because leading up to that, the, the violator and spawn fight is really good i think um you can tell when they're using a puppet you know a a big animatronic violator and when they switch to the cg but most of it i think works um anytime they use the the cg spawn mask kind of when that mask goes on i absolutely love that i think that holds up so well and we're we're kind of speeding through this. We're having, you know, for the listeners, we're having some like audio, some some technical problems. So we're not doing our typical like go scene by scene. That's kind of why we're jumping all th- all around this. But so yeah, there 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 was a lot of this that I I do think really works. But yeah, to end with that that big messy battle in hell, it's it's such a letdown because up until then, like I'm really having fun with it, you know. I, I think in the end, when you look at this, I mean, I think you and I discussed this a couple of years ago, but I mean, the late nineties, okay. Mm-hmm. Was, was kind of a, um, it was an interesting time for, uh, for comic based movies. I'd say the mid to the late nineties, because you weren't getting the big stuff coming out of yeah. Marvel yet. And what you were getting out of DC was Batman, but Batman was pretty much on its last. Oh, effects. sure. Batman was kind of, was kind of dying. And so what you had is you had studios who were who were picking up um, comic properties, maybe that uh, were not. How do I want to say traditional? It? You had studios, yeah. You had studios picking up comic properties that, yes, were based on comics, but they were kind of dancing around the fact that it was based on a comic. Yeah, you know I mean? oh yeah. So you had uh, Phantom and Judge Dredd and things like that. But Spawn was just such such an anomaly. It was so cool because you had. A, uh, a a comic based film that was I'd say for the most part ninety to ninety five percent a lead to its source moment. Sure, and that's something that you just you didn't really get at the time. You know what I mean? If you look at Judge Dredd, Judge Dredd took a ton of liberties yeah. with that source material. Um, the Batman and Robin that came out the same summer, that one took. I mean, it's almost like I don't even think the writers of that one even read the the source sure. material. You know what I mean? Yeah, they've been making. But I think yeah, they've been making Batman yeah, movies for one, so long they didn't really care much about the source material anymore yeah yeah exactly um but this one this one was really interesting i mean and again as a fan who um who read comics and who collected them this was uh this was pretty cool to see yeah and i'd like to think it was a film like this that kind of got got producers and everybody realizing you know what yes it can be done okay you you can adapt something from a comic book and it can make a relatively coherent film maybe this movie is not um, the best example right. that you know holds up twenty twenty some odd years twenty some odd years later, but I think for the most part it um, it it worked. Yeah, I one thing that did that definitely did not work for me, and I didn't notice it the hundred times that I watched this. You know, between ninety seven and I don't know maybe two thousand three is probably when I watched this the most, and then I haven't watched it since then. You know, think something I didn't notice was. Almost every scene or every other scene, you know, so every five to 10 minutes, they're explaining the the motivation. Just so many scenes of them explaining, okay, so Spawn, you're going to kill Jason. 
then we're going to take over the world. We're going to release this virus. We're going to kill everybody. Then, then hell is going to have enough soldiers, you know, and then we're going to take, you know, go after the gates of heaven and, and, you know, start this war, start Armageddon. You know, it's like every few minutes of the movie is some combination of characters. You know, if it's clown and uh, Jason Wynn, then they're going at it, you know, clown is is strategic in how he phrases everything because he wants jason to think he's going to get what he wants you know but and same with spawn if he's talking to spawn that he spawn thinks he's going to get what he wants and you know every few minutes though it's like they have to explain what the the goal is and it's probably because they made this a PG 13 movie and they thought that that kids needed that refresher every every so often, which I don't think they do. And it definitely, well, I, think, I think it definitely stood out to me this time. And I, I yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right. I mean, it, it really, like you, like we talked about earlier, it, it's way too convoluted for its own good. It gets, um, and I think the more convoluted it gets, the more silly it gets. Yeah. I think if they had, stripped away stripped away some of the this excess plot and uh um exposition dumps then yeah. maybe it might have uh it might have been better but i think also what it comes down to is the writer and everybody are trying their are trying their damnedest to adapt this uh adapt to this world that Todd McFarlane had you know at the time so many issues to really flesh out oh sure I mean, if you look at it now i think i think the comic has been running now I remember seeing it's gone well over 200 issues. It's, it's in the three hundreds now. Is it in the three hundreds? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, in the end, I think that's, it, it's almost kind of one of those things that's a little unfair. And I think that's one yeah. of the things that the Marvel movie, the Marvel movies are able to do is because what they're able to do is they have so many films already in their, in a tank at this point <laughs> yeah. to where they can make a, they can make one single movie that tells a, a six, a six issue story arc, if you will. You know what sure. I mean? they, they have one movie that can tell, that can tell one particular arc. Again, you got to look at the time. 1997, this came out. You didn't have too many comic movies. You're, ma- you're, you're making a movie that is um, adapting this world that had so many issues already to establish. You're going to do that in a 100-minute movie. It's, it's, it's tough to do. Right. You know what I mean? And like I said, should they have, should they have taken away some of, the, uh, some of the excess near the end, especially with Jason Wynn releasing the virus and everything yeah. like that? Probably, probably. I think, but I think what in the end, what they wanted is they wanted to throw so much stakes, so many stakes at the character, right? Um, to make it to make it a spectacle. And um, you know, like I said earlier, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier. You know what I mean? I think in the end, it's you know maybe they may miss, maybe they may strike out, but I think it's it's better to swing defensive and try and give us something. Mm. You know I mean? And I think as I watch as I watch this again, you know, on my recent viewing in preparation for this, that's the thing that I was looking at as I, I was just so appreciative of the fact that this came out at a time when we didn't see too many comic books. It, it made some attempts and it tried and it is a little silly. Sure. I think yeah. blade, a okay, mm. blade that came out a couple of years later, that one tried to tread a lot of the same ground. And I think maybe sure. it's a little more successful in some respects, but um, you know what? Hey, this one made an attempt and, uh, and I think it was, I mean, it didn't, it fell short in terms of uh, what I think McFarlane and, and, and New Line Cinema had, had, uh, had hoped for, I guess, in terms of the box office. But I know in rentals and VHS sales, yeah. it made gangbusters. So I think they, they did see a profit. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's funny you mentioned New Line. And, and when I was watching it and when Cagliostro is, is teaching Spawn about his powers and he wraps him up in the chains... I guarantee they used some of the special effects, you know, computer model and sound effects when the mask is doing like tornadoes in his apartment and, you know, doing stuff like that. It's, it's pulled directly from the mask, the mask. Um, And then that's kind of like when I was watching it, I was like, this is just the mask. Like he's just spinning around, you know, in, in this whirling tornado and it's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. It's a new line kind of thing. And then mm-hmm. then there were other things throughout the movie that was like, wait, this feels like something from Blade. Like, I'm pretty sure the the guns that Priest carries and, and several of the guns that, that Spawn would, would use a few times, like, 
I'm pretty sure they use the same guns and blade. Just oh. something to well, something I mean, to look. That's... You know, I think it's just something that they probably created and and kept in the new line. You know, prop warehouse. Oh, exactly. I think New Line, in a lot of ways, was similar to Canon Films. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and also, I mean, if you look at uh, Warner Brothers, uh, Warner Brothers, you know, with what they did with the Space Jam movie, just recycling all of their characters Mm. and bragging, hey, this is what we have. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But, you know, it's interesting. If you watch the movie, I mean, New Line Cinema, they were doing this. If you saw the movie uh, Loaded Weapon 1. Uh, okay. Lampoon, loaded weapon one. There's a clip from uh, the original Ninja Turtles movie, Ninja Turtles movie in that one. Oh, okay. If you look at uh, if you look at the Friday movie with Ice Cube. Okay. There's a scene where um, Ice Cube's uh, dad, played by John Witherspoon, is watching a movie. The movie he's watching is Man's Best Friend. Oh, okay. okay. It's a killer dog movie. Yeah. That was put out by New Line. So I mean, it's okay. You know, it's 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 not entirely surprising to me. I think it's kind of one of those things that's kind of because we don't get New Line cinema really putting out much in so uh you know when i see that it's kind of it's kind of nice <laughs> yeah hmm. I'm just kind of looking through my notes is there anything major that we haven't really talked you know touched on i mean i know we're we skipped kind of through the story of the movie but it's kind of more fun i think with this one to talk about the movie and not you know each individual scene so i, I well and yeah and, and I'm, I'm sorry about that that maybe we didn't but i think oh, in no. the end i, I think <laughs> In the end, I don't know if this film really needs to go scene by scene because this film is basically a variation on the on the Faust, you know what I mean, on the Faust storyline, where you have someone who makes a deal with the devil mm, and sure. is facing the repercussions of that. And I think what oh, yeah. Tom McFarlane did is he, he took the, the, the Faust mythos, if you will, and turned it into a superhero. And that's basically yeah. what this film is. You have, you have an assassin who makes a deal with the devil, is using those powers then for the greater good, to be, be, be being a superhero, yeah. I, I, you know, I think I've uh, touched upon all of uh, all of the uh, main points I really wanted to. You know, the, the one thing we we talked about, but I just really want to hit upon again, is how much I just miss the days of. You know, what's okay. interesting about news is their films all had a very similar aesthetic and a very similar to where every time you watched a new line cinema movie, you knew that um, you were going to be getting something maybe that wasn't amazing. But that was different yeah. from the main. I mean, and so they had just a ton of stuff that came out of their wheelhouse in the '90s. That uh, that was that, that was really awesome. That was a ton of fun. It's kind of cool to say that we were that we were alive and were cinephiles during the during the age of <laughs> but um, yeah, but yeah, but it only makes sense that Spawn came from the same you know, Mortal Kombat and uh, right. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> and um, what was one of the other ones they did? Oh, they yeah. did an amazing one in 1994 called surviving the game with uh ice tea and oh Mark yeah power. that one sure that one is amazing so anyway hmm. that, that that's my final uh my final thought regarding new line oh right on um i i think of them in this era like a lot like dimension films which i think was like an offshoot yes. of miramax you know just they kind of has the same kind of feel at least in the 90s and then new line would eventually you know in the two thousands go on to do the Lord of the Rings movies. And then, I mean, obviously that hit huge. And then I think they got absorbed into Warner brothers. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you'll still see occasionally their logo pop up on some, on some various Warner brothers releases, but it's right. It's just not the same. You know what I mean? It's yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. So, but, uh, but no, I, I had a ton of fun, uh, oh, good. reminiscing with this one with you and, <laughs> and going back through because not only was it, uh, I mean, I remember being 14 years old when this came out. So not yeah, only same. was it, uh, was it a, yeah, not only was it a fun time to see this film in the theaters, because I mean, let's face it, we were the prime demographic for this movie yeah. when it came out, but it was also, it was also such a, a ton of fun to be a comic book collector, mm. you know, in that early nineties period as well. Sure. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I went through a phase where like I kind of came back to spawn in when I started in college and then I started to collect old spawn issues. And aside from Spider-Man spawn is like my number two most collected character. Like I have, you know, like the first hundred issues and I have like the first, the last a hundred issues. I'm missing a big chunk in the middle, but like I still collect Spawn. I haven't read a Spawn comic in probably five years, but I still get you know every issue that I, I, I'm waiting you know for that retirement to sit down and read Spawn from start to finish. But 
Well, it was about, what was it, about eight, maybe 10 years ago or so, they threw, um, Tom McFarlane decided, you know, he, he, he kind of tried to make news and he was like, you yeah. know, I've been focusing, I've been focusing much more on my toy company than on the comic book. So I'm going to throw everyone for a loop. I'm going to, uh, start writing the series again, yeah. and I'm going to kill off, I'm going to kill off Al Simmons and bring in a new spawn. And it was, it was one of those things where it was kind of like, okay, well, Todd, I don't think anybody cares about Spawn anymore, sadly, <laughs> yeah. but you go ahead and you do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I remember I did buy I did buy that issue just to see what it was all about. It was kind of cool, but the, the magic had kind of been gone. I mean, on one hand, I respect the fact that I think it's so cool that um, Todd is, uh, uh, McFarlane is still going strong with the character. Sure. Still doing, but on the other hand, it's one of those things where, you know, he keeps talking about a Spawn movie, but it's one of those things where it's like, no, no one... And I hate saying this. I know this makes me sound like a, like a terrible fanboy, but no one cares anymore. About right. Spawn. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's one of those characters that no one really, no one really cares about. And if, I honestly think that if a new Spawn movie came out, it would be one of those things that would go straight to streaming. You know what yeah. I mean? It's just, it's yeah. not a character that, that people care about, you know, but, um, for sure. But the one thing that this, one of the, one of the many, one of the few things I think that this film did right is it was made and it came out at the character's height. Yeah. At the, at the height of the character's popularity. And that right there is pretty old. Yeah. I mean, we could probably say that maybe had they waited to, you know, 10 years after the, the character came out, maybe do this movie a little later, it may have been more successful, you know, maybe not, but you know, it is what it is. I, I, I did have fun rewatching it, but I could definitely now I could see, a lot of the flaws. I mean, for me, the the physical creation of Spawn on on screen totally worked. You know, the the practical effects of the suit. I mean, they had Greg Nicotero um, from like The Walking Dead and um, made all a lot of zombie you know stuff, doing like special uh, uh, makeup, you know that sort of stuff. Those guys knew what they were doing. Robert Kurtzman, he's done a bunch of special effects prop modeling and, and physical creations and stuff that uh, were made for this movie that I think really hold up. And um, like I said before, a lot of the CG actually does hold up. It's just well known for the stuff that doesn't hold up. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, it was, you know, it, like it, it's a product of the time, yeah. you know what I mean? And I think a lot of those um, weak special effects, I think by today's standards are kind of endearing Yeah, to be perfectly honest. Um, but uh but yeah, no, I, I again, I, I, I can't thank you enough oh, yeah. for, uh, for not only extending the invite, but let me uh, let me jump on board this one with you. Absolutely. This was this was, this was fun to uh, to go back and uh, and do. Now, if only we can get that Savage Dragon movie, <laughs> then we'd yeah. be set. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's let's end this with uh, going over uh, what what do you think the most villainous moment in this movie is? This planet, these people, they are nothing. You were made to be ruled. The universe is power! You unstoppable power! Come to me, son of Jarrell! Kneel before Zod! And I am that force! I am that power! In the end, you will always kneel. Kneel before your master! Shoot, the most villainous moment. Lego's almost clown character is just so disgusting mm. in, in every way. Um, th there's a scene where he is, you already mentioned it, but the scene where he is kind of leering at, uh, is it Wanda? Oh, yeah. If I remember right. Yeah, he's kind of leering at her and kind of um, being a little uh, uh, suggestive, I, I think we can say. That scene is pretty gross, where he shows up as the clown at uh, uh well excuse me he he is a yeah. clown but where he shows up as a birthday party clown right at uh science birthday party which good lord i'm sorry as <laughs> yeah. a parent myself oh man if i saw if i saw him show up i'd be like you can turn around you're gonna yeah. give my kids a nightmare yeah you know what i mean so that was pretty villainous everything with the clown sure is villainous <laughs> that were, yeah that's fair uh my my main one is the kind of at the, at the beginning when al is double crossed and they they destroy this this North Korean, you know, facility that's making, you know, nuclear weapons or that's making a biological weapon. So they destroy this facility and then the town nearby with a population of I think eight thousand is what they say are all subjected to this, you know, biological 
agent that then becomes the basis of their heat 16, you know, their viral thing that's going to kill the world essentially. So just opening the movie with a, uh, like nuking a town with this, uh, this biological weapon is, is pretty villainous. Um, my runner up to that would be, there's a kid in this movie who's homeless and living in the alleys. And at one point his dad gets killed by violator. And at the end of the movie, he shows up, you know, to help, you know, he shows up with, uh, Al's dog and, and kind of is at the, you know, Terry and Wanda's house. And then you see him again and he's just, in the alley again. So, you know, failure on all the adults here who let this kid just go back to living in an alley. Yeah. That, that was a big thing in the comic books was, uh, yeah. was the family, if you will, that, uh, spawned yeah. kind of adopted in the homeless community. Yeah. 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 How about most heroic? I believe there's a hero in all of us. I just finally know what I have to do. That keeps us honest. I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. Gives us strength. You will give the people of Earth an ideal to strive towards. Makes us noble. And I know in my heart that it's right. Yes, okay, and, it, and it's a small moment, but the one scene that has always stayed with me that I have always loved, okay, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a like a, a fist pump Mm. to the year for all men in the world. I don't know. It's the scene where um, Priest <laughs> gets ready to kick. You know the scene I'm talking about. Yeah, it's where she's getting ready to kick a, a spawn right in the groin. And as soon as she does that, his because his suit is an entity itself. His suit is alive. His suit is breathing, if you will. And so right as soon as she does that, his belt comes alive and comes out and snatches her her foot and her boot and just clamps down on it. And, you know, it's kind of like one of those moments yeah. where it's like, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, mine, I kind of had a joke one here. Mine is when uh, Spaz, the little dog, Spaz sees his, uh, his, his owner, Al, you know, getting damn near getting killed by Violator and uh, runs up and starts to bites Violator on the leg. And <laughs> is, he actually oh, creates, cool. yeah. creates a little moment of for Al to sort of get away, not. Ultimately, he doesn't get away, but, you know, stopped him from getting killed. Yeah, so. no, it, it's, a, it's a great moment for... Just good for dog, dog loyalty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. What would you... Uh, let, let's let's wrap this up, and uh, what, what kind of rating would you give it out of, out of five? Well, that, that, oh, boy. Are, are we ranking it as a, as a comic book movie or as a movie in general? Because I think those are two different avenues. You know I, I tend to rate everything that we review on the show based on... Not you're not comparing it to The Godfather, you know. It, it's what is this movie? R rate this as you would a comic book movie, I guess. Um. Well, you know, I'm gonna be a little. Um, I'm gonna be a little. De you know, I'm gonna go a four. I'm gonna go a four. Wow. And I'm gonna be perfectly honest. I I think the um, and I and I'll look. It's 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 inadequacies, if you will. I'll, I'll put those firmly on my sleeve. I get it. But I think a lot of the comic books comic book based movies that are coming out nowadays, like the Thor that has come out and everything. I think they're almost becoming a little too, a little too tongue in cheek, mm. a little too goofy, a little too silly. And look, I get that some listeners are going to be listening to this and saying, saying, well, they're, they're based on a comic book, Sean, like, what, what do you expect? <laughs> and so I get that. But I think also, you know, you, you don't need to make a parody. You don't need to make a, a total, um, a total cheese ball fest. You know what I mean? Like you can still, Try yeah. to make it as a, uh, uh, and so yeah, I think my my grade is kind of based maybe on nostalgia, right? If you will, but um, but you know, I uh, th that would be my grade. Maybe when I listen back to this, when this goes live, I'll think, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> this was a solid, this was a solid two and a half, right? Movie. But at the moment, I'm gonna say, c compared to I just saw Thor: Love and Thunder, mm, and I just yeah. thought it was it was just a little too you know, silly and cornball. And it, it's almost like, what are we doing here? Is this a Saturday Night Live funded <laughs> yeah. thing, you know? Um, so maybe I'm looking at it through that lens. But uh, at the moment, I feel pretty confident with that, with that grade. Right on. I, I went into this thinking nostalgia was going to take over and I was just going to fall in love with this one all over again. And for me, like, I, I, like I said, I enjoyed a lot of it, but I didn't enjoy 
a lot of it, you know, the, the CGI stuff that we've talked about, the, the but noticing the story really for the first time, you know, and really it's it's it does so little, you know, most of this, the first half is just Spawn trying to figure out how he can get back to Wanda. And then every other scene is is filled up with the same conversation, you know, just just re-explaining how we need to kickstart this war and and all that. So there really isn't much, you know, meat here. It's just a lot of filler. So I really did not enjoy that aspect of it. Um, so I, I went with a two on this one, okay. you know, if Patrick were on this episode, he would hate this movie. Um, I'm sure he would have given it like a 0.5 probably or a one. So, well, and I think, I think, yeah, I think a lot of that filler is because they were hoping this would be a franchise. And so you oh, kind yeah. of need that one film. You need that one film to kind of establish the world. So then yeah. by film number two, you can really you know dig in deep. And so unfortunately, we never got that number yeah. two. Um, so yeah, I, but I, I, I totally get that. I kind of wondered with that Angela uh, cameo, if you will, the, uh, having her in that scene, you know, she's a, a spawn hunter. And is at this gala and, you know, f- two minutes later, Spawn drops through the skyline and she's not there to fight him, you know. So I think maybe why didn't they, you know, they weren't doing end credits stingers at this point. But why not end the movie with like, you know, this lady comes into the alley and, you know, all of a sudden it's it's Angela and she's about to fight Spawn and then credits, you know. Like if you want to put her in and the movie, like tease her for a sequel. So, and the other thing that I noticed was, uh, they, when priest gets killed, they make a, almost make a big deal about putting her on ice instead of just throwing her like in a body bag. It's like they're, it's almost like they wanted to preserve her body for something. And I don't know if that was going to be something later, but I thought that was odd. Speaking of like potential sequels. Well, I mean, the, the the thing that's interesting with uh, with McFarlane is, I mean, once he, uh, you know, he's he's kind of stepped away in, in a lot of ways from. I mean, he's still running the characters, but he's so much more invested in his toy company, yeah. if you will. And so, I think I think while we may never, while we didn't get a sequel to this, I think he kind of made a sequel of sorts with his figures. You know what I mean? Like he. Put oh out yeah, various reissues of Spawn and Angela and everything, and they're really not even. Let's be honest, they're really not even action figures. They're they're statues for adult oh, collectors. Yeah. But I mean, he he really put his time into putting together some really um some really fantastic sculpts, and so I think that was kind of his way of yeah, maybe I didn't get a sequel, but I'm gonna I'm gonna infuse this this storyline with this character here in this right. figure. I don't know, maybe I'm no, yeah, I, I, but I think that's. Um, I do want to share, I had uh, a post on our Facebook group and Nate Withrow of the It's Time to Rewind podcast said, "Um, I enjoy this one, even though I won't say it's a great film. Martin Sheen and John Leguizamo are chewing scenery in the best in the best way possible. Uh, There's also fun little details like a clown air freshener before he's introduced. I, I never noticed that. Um but I never turned down a chance to call out the worst CGI devil ever. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no. And I imagine maybe with my four ranking, I'm going to probably get a lot of your uh, <laughs> followers and whatnot are going to be saying, okay, never have this guy on again, but uh, I'll, I'll stand by it today. So, <laughs> well, you're welcome back anytime as far as I'm concerned. So, um, well, well hey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and hit your, uh, hit where they can hear you again, you know, talk about, your show and where they can find it. Yeah. So like I said earlier, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, it's, I must break this podcast, which is the Dolph Lundgren fan podcast. This might be one of the, the first times I'm, I'm stepping out of the realm of looking at action mm. heroes like Arnold and Stallone right. and everything. So th- thank you. Thank you for this yeah. opportunity. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we look at um, all the films of, uh, of the big Swede, Mr. <laughs> Lundgren and um, uh, tons of fun interview episodes and, uh, You've been uh, gracious enough to join me for an episode a few years back. Yeah. And we actually have you slotted to join me for um, an upcoming one. That's right. We look at uh, Arrow, Arrow, um, Dolph's stint on uh, the show Arrow. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. But uh, but again, this was this is an absolute treat. Thank you for uh, uh, 
invite me on and I'm sorry about the various audio hiccups, but uh, I, I think in the end we got a, we got a good conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely had fun talking about this movie and, and yeah, it kind of worked out that we just kind of got to reminisce about it instead of just, just going through it, you know, beat by beat. So probably worked out for the yeah. best. So let's see. I don't have too much to wrap up with. Uh, we will be back with, Oh boy. We'll be back with steel. The Shaquille O'Neal DC comic movie, man, and and this will be a, a first time viewing for me. I've never seen Steel, so oh, you're in for a treat. Uh, well, <laughs> well, I, I, so I've never seen the movie, but I have heard podcasts like How Did This Get Made talk about Steel. So I've I've heard other shows talk about the movie, so I kind of know basically the the main elements, but. Uh, should be interesting. Godspeed to you. Yeah, appreciate that. So, yeah, uh, that's going to do it for this one. Uh, hopefully, Patrick will, will be with us next time. Uh, but until then, stay safe out there, citizens. How would you like to help me deal the next generation of super weapons to the world? The weapons of tomorrow. I've already made quite a few of these dandy little toys. Do you really want to be the only ones without my kind of firepower? Terrorizing our cities today. Officers down. We got a big problem here. Now to protect those hey, who can't fight back. The gang still messing with him? Worse than ever. One man must stand up for the people. Well, maybe the police aren't enough. Maybe we need a new kind of firepower for ourselves. Got you, bro. What exactly am I supposed to be doing here? We make our own kind of weapons to take out the ones in the streets. To stop the enemy without hurting them. And become a new breed of hero. It might get a little dangerous. I laugh at danger. I boogie around danger like a soul train dancer. With a will of iron, a heart of gold, and a body of steel. It's hammer time. What a magnetic personality. We well, gotta admit, the guy's got style. For listening to the podcast, find the show on Facebook and Twitter at Real Comic Heroes. All music and audio are the property of their respective creators.